Max Stirner, one of the most radical philosophers for the concept of individualism, anarchism, and of anarcho-egoism. Stirner, in his most important book called The Ego and His Own, makes the strident case of the individual against authority. He challenges religion, philosophical and political constraints that hamper on the reality of personal freedom. The first chapter to the second part of his book, called Ownness, outlines with precision and quick succession what his view is in relation to egoism and selfishness. He brings up the fundamental problem of freedom, that freedom in its most general conception is impossible. People vouch for freedom but don't realise that freedom is ridding of oneself, everything that embraces you. But when it comes to self-understanding, there are parts of ourselves that don't bring us inconvenience. Due to this, he says, I quote, You gladly let freedom go when unfreedom suits you, and you take up your freedom again on occasion when it begins to suit you better. End quote. He also says this, I quote, Freedom all you want, you want freedom. Why do you higgle over a more or less? Freedom can only be the whole of freedom. A piece of freedom is not freedom. You despair of the possibility of obtaining the whole of freedom, freedom from everything. Yes, you consider it insanity even to wish this. Well, then leave off chasing after the phantom and spend your pains on something better than the unattainable. End quote. With this being said, Stirner vouches for what he calls ownness. To own oneself, to forward the personal I to everything we do. He says that religion is what has called us to view ourselves as naturally wrong, that our fundamental essence needs mending. I quote, The habit of the religious way of thinking has biased our mind so grievously that we are terrified at ourselves in our nakedness and naturalness. It has degraded us so that we deem ourselves depraved by nature, born devils, end quote. When Stirner brings up the question of what am I, we can see how Nietzsche was heavily influenced by this work. I quote, An abyss of lawless and unregulated impulses, desires, wishes, passions, and chaos without light or guided star. How am I to obtain a correct answer? If without regard to God's commandments, or the duties which morality prescribes, without regard to the voice of reason, I simply appeal to myself? My passion would advise me to do the most senseless thing possible. Thus each deems himself the devil." End quote. When it comes to egoism, Stirner strongly vouches for psychological egoism. This is the strict notion that all human conducts are always done out of self-interest, that altruism is very much non-existent or that which is not the primary matter of concern when it comes to action. The ways in which he supports this claim is by looking through history and most specifically religion. He asks the question, I quote, For whose sake do you care about gods and the other commandments? Do you follow these commandments out of compliance towards God? For Stirner, this is not the case. He claims you only do so for your sake, for your self-interest. Obedience to God is not out of respect for God, but respect and concern for yourself for your own self-interest, not for the sake of altruism. He sees everything based on these two concepts of ownness and psychological egoism. For example, he furthers his claim by saying that Christians once condemned Apollo and Minevira or heathen morality. They then replaced this with Christ, Mary and Christian morality. I quote, They did this for the sake of their soul's welfare too, therefore out of egoism and ownness. And it was by this egoism, this ownness, that they got rid of the old world of gods and became free from it. Ownness creates a new form of freedom, for ownness is the creator of everything, as genius, a definite ownness, which is always originality, for has a long time already been looked upon as the creator of new productions that have a place in the history of the world. End quote. For Stirner, religion is founded on egoism, so therefore religion, in his view, exploits it. How? This is done by what he calls cheated egoism, whereby religion constructs moral principles that after commitment will not satisfy myself, but one of my desires. For example, as he quotes, the impulse towards blessedness. Individual self-realization rests on each individual's desire to fill their egoism. 
The difference between an unwilling and a willing egoist is that the former will be possessed by an empty idea and belief that they are fulfilling a higher cause, but usually being unaware that they are only fulfilling their own desires to be happy or secure, and the latter, in contrast, will be a person that is able to freely choose its actions, fully aware that they are only fulfilling individual desires. I quote, Religion promises me the supreme good. To gain this, I no longer regard any other of my desires. All your doings are unconfessed, secret, covert, and concealed egoism. But because you are egoism that you are unwilling to confess to yourselves, that you keep secret from yourselves, hence not manifest and public egoism, consequently unconscious egoism. Therefore, they are not egoism, but thraldom, service, self-renunciation. You are egoists, and you are not, since you renounce egoism. Where you seem most to be such, you have drawn upon the word egoists, loathing and contempt." End quote. So here he is saying that egoism is fundamental to everything. To a religious person, he believes that bringing about the supreme moral good from within that religion is simply driven by desire or impulse which will be self-gratifying. But because we are told it to be a supreme good, the reality of selfishness is pushed into the unconscious and makes it concealed. But at the same time, people will view egoism with loathing and contempt. I quote, Sacred things exist only for the egoist who does not acknowledge himself, the involuntary egoist, in short, for the egoist who would like not to be an egoist and abases himself, combats his egoism, but at the same time abases himself only for the sake of being exalted, and therefore of gratifying his egoism, because he would like to cease to be an egoist. He looks about in heaven and earth for higher beings to serve and sacrifice himself to, but, however much he shakes and disciplines himself, in the end he does all for his own sake. On this account I call him the involuntary egoist. As you are each instant, you are your own creature. In this very creature, you do not wish to lose yourself, the creator. You are yourself, a higher being than you are, and surpass yourself. Just this, as an involuntary egoist, you fail to recognise, and therefore the highest essence is to you an alien essence, Alienness is a criterion of the sacred. End quote. Sterner here sees that the sacred is simply the desired impulse of self interested egoism hidden behind a sacred veil of holiness, whereby they are only fulfilling their own interest in being regarded as safe in the eyes of the Lord, for example. Freedom for Sterner is only conceivable through one's capacity for ownness. Only through might can we become free. I quote, why is the freedom of the peoples a hollow word? Because the people have no might, end quote. One goes further with a handful of might than with a bag full of right. You long for freedom, you fools. If you took might, freedom would come of itself, end quote. Another quote, all freedom is essentially self-liberation, that I can have only so much freedom as I procure for myself by my ownness, end quote. Stirner has been broadly understood as a proponent of both psychological egoism and ethical egoism. Although the latter position can be disputed, as there is no claim in Stirner's writings in which one ought to pursue one's own interest further claiming any ought could be seen as a new fixed idea, therefore he may be understood as a rational egoist, in the sense that he considered it irrational not to act in one's own self-interest. Sterner does also advocate for a form of utilitarian egoism. I quote, If I am not concerned about a thing in and for itself, and do not desire it for its own sake, then I desire it solely as a means to an end, for its usefulness. End quote. The distinction between Sterner's egoism and Rand's is most clear in regards to morality. Sterner's view on the sacred or sacred truths such as religion, morality, law and rights are nothing but artificial concepts, and not to be obeyed can one then act freely. Freedom is then only possible of being one's own creature, but also one's creator, which is the contrasting difference between the voluntary and involuntary egoist. Morality, in Sterner's view, is taking up obligations to behave in certain rigid, fixed ways. Because of this, he rejects morality due to its incompatibility with egoism. Rand, on the other hand, 
regards morality or objectivism as an essential guide to genuine self-interest. Though a strict atheist, Ayn Rand's thought develops an objective and binding moral system. Sterner, on the other hand, sees all morality as a spook of the mind. This so-called spook is an attempt to constrict the individual from the chance at defining self-interest and individuality. The author and philosopher Anne Rand takes the position of rational and ethical egoism, which largely differs from Stirner. She holds that it is both irrational and immoral to act against one's self-interest. Thus, her view is a synthesis of both rational egoism and ethical egoism. As for the latter, she uses her philosophy of objectivism to attempt justification that egoism cannot be properly justified without an epistemology based on reason and rationality. Rand furthers this endorsement of self-interest by her rejection of the ethical doctrine of altruism. According to Rand, there is only one alternative of being rationally self-interested. This is sacrificing one's proper interests, either for the sake of other people, by being altruistic, or for the sake of the supernatural belief. She makes the claim that the fundamental premise of altruism is the following, I quote, that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the only justification of his existence, and that self-sacrifice is his highest moral duty, virtue and value, end quote. In further writings on the topic of altruism, from her book, Philosophy Who Needs It, she writes the following. Do not confuse altruism with kindness, goodwill or respect for the rights of others. These are not primaries, but consequences, which in fact, altruism makes impossible. The irreducible primary of altruism, the basic absolute is self-sacrifice, which means self-immolation, self-abnegation, self-denial, self-destruction which means the self as a standard of evil, the selfless as a standard of the good. Do not hide behind such superficialities as whether you should or should not give a dime to a beggar. This is not the issue. The issue is whether you do or do not have the right to exist without giving him that dime. The issue is whether you must keep buying your life dime by dime from any beggar who might choose to approach you. The issue is whether the need of others is the first mortgage on your life and the moral purpose of your existence. The issue is whether man is to be regarded as a sacrificial animal. Any man of self-esteem will answer, no. Altruism says, yes, end quote. Within the ethics of objectivism, Rand's explanation of values presents the proposition that an individual's primary moral obligation is to achieve his own well-being. For his life and self-interest, that an individual ought to obey a moral code. Thus she uses ethical egoism as setting for man's moral standard of self-interest and well-being. Something Stirner advocated for was individualist anarchism, with his anti-state conception of the union of egoists. But early 19th century anarchism for individuality was something Rand and objectivism extremely disliked. She specifically regarded anarchism as a I quote, naive floating abstraction, and any of the sort that did not follow by the objectivist movement would be granted as something without relation to the concrete. She saw anarchism as something of gang rule, and not something which would promote freedom. So how does Nietzsche's view on egoism pair up to Rand? With this question in mind, we have to ask crucial questions regarding the self, free will, reason, rationality, and universal values. Egoism is a thesis that fundamentally rests on the concept of morality. Because existence of morality presupposes that moral agents make choices for which they can be held responsible, for which presupposes the existence of free will when it comes to making choices, hence egoism. When it comes to free will, Rand argues this to be true of humans in the case that man's reason is of a volitional capacity. But Nietzsche does nothing but reject volitional causation in regards to free will, but relies on biological determinism. I quote, A brazen wall of fate. We are in prison. We can only dream ourselves free, not make ourselves free. End quote. The single human being is a piece of fatum from the front and from the rear. One law more, one necessity more for all that is yet to come and to be. 
He ridicules the idea of self-causation, saying, I quote, the concept is something fundamentally absurd, end quote. With Nietzsche's disbelief in self-causation and free will, of being a volitional nature, it would make little sense for Nietzsche to make moral judgments of good and evil about individuals. Unlike Anne Rand, this uproots the possibility of Nietzsche ever following ethical egoism because he does not place moral judgments when he doesn't believe in self-causation or free will. For Nietzsche, the value of an individual is measured in terms of the individual's ability to advance the human species. So if egoism concludes that the individual is an end in themselves, then Nietzsche would be regarded as an egoist, right? In Twilight of the Idols, he says the following. The value of egoism depends on the physiological value of him who possesses it. It can be very valuable. It can be worthless and contemptible. Every individual may be regarded as representing the ascending or descending line of life. When one has decided which, one has thereby established a canon for the value of his egoism. If he represents the ascending line, his value is in fact extraordinary. And for the sake of the life collective, which with him takes a step forward, the case expected on this preservation, on the creation of optimum conditions for him, may even be extreme." End quote. For the major population, Nietzsche is an anti-egoist. That egoism is only valuable if the individual represents the ascending line of life. To give an example of Nietzsche's strident anti-egoist temperament, he says the following, I quote, Mankind in the mass sacrificed to the prosperity of a single strong species of man, that would be an advantage, end quote. Another quote, he says, If one regards individuals as equal, one calls the species into question. One encourages a way of life that leads to ruin of the species, end quote. The value of egoism, then, is to Nietzsche measured by evaluating the individual's capacity for advancing the species. In regards to altruism, he sees it as a fundamental disappointment, a sign of decadence and further decline. This is especially in relation to Christianity's altruism. I quote, Man is finished when he becomes altruistic. Instead of saying naively, I am no longer worth anything, the moral lie in the mouth of the decadent says, nothing is worth anything. Life is not worth anything. End quote. From what I know personally so far, I don't think Nietzsche views individuals as being only altruistic or egoistic, but being dependent on their will to power. He refers to egoism in a biologically deterministic fashion, with regards to ascending and descending lines. He also uses figureheads such as Napoleon and their will to power or egoism as that which predicates an affirmative life. Stern and Rand's conclusive differences mostly remain in disagreement surrounding objective morality. Stern rejects it because it constrains individual egoism, but Nietzsche rejects objective morality for radical subjectivity. Again, this radical subjectivity is also influenced by his biological determinism. I quote, It is always necessary to draw forth the physiological phenomenon behind the moral predispositions and prejudices. When we do so, we learn that our moral judgments and evaluations are only images and fantasies based on a physiological process unknown to us. End quote. So finally, in relation to reason, Rand and Nietzsche are again in complete opposition. Rand sees reason as a primary value in ethics, which produces what she regards of the highest of all virtues, rationality. Nietzsche, on the other hand, as again, doesn't see reason as being the highest of all values. He sees it more or less as an offshoot or byproduct of the passions. Similar to Stirner, he recognises the foundation and a priori structure of the human condition being a collective of instinctful biological drives which manifest themselves psychologically in the forms of felt passions and desires. Some of these passions and desires further manifest themselves as conscious, rational experiences. As such, rational judgments are not to be regarded as the descriptors of action, because consciousness and rationality are the human capacities which come after our instinctful drives and capacities. So we can see that Nietzsche disagrees with Rand on ethical egoism, the volition of reason, morality being objective, free will and the primacy of reason and rationality as being of highest virtue and value. So I hope this ties up the different perspectives of three of the most influential philosophers in regards to egoism and individualism.
If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe and comment down below to get involved in the discussion. Talking about discussion, you can find a link to the new Thoughts and Thinking Facebook group down below, so make sure to join if you want to get involved in conversations about philosophy, sociology, psychology and literature. Make sure to follow my social medias such as Instagram and Twitter to keep up to date with everything that is going on, and also Patreon, where you can donate a minimum of $2. Lastly, a quick shout out to my patrons. Thank you to Daniel Kazmi, The Truthism, Noah, Danny and Shahad for supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching and I will speak to you in the next video.